Welcome to the seventh seminar in our transplant series. Today we have Ms. Dyson and Laura Middleton with us to speak about relocation and financial considerations in patients with cystic fibrosis undergoing a lung transplant. At the end of the talk, there will be an opportunity to ask questions via phone or via the chat feature on the right-hand panel of the screen. Annie and Laura, thank you for joining us today, and I'll pass it over to you to start today's talk. Great, thank you. Um, so just a little bit of background about uh, why, this, uh, why this topic has come up. Um, it was just sort of thought that there were some gaps in knowledge in terms of uh, the financial considerations in transplant practice, what that looks like pre-transplant, during, and post. Um, we know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of different information flying around as well about coverage between provinces, um, including the pre-transplant medication coverage and post-transplant medication coverage. So we want to touch on some of those things just to provide a bit of clarity um, or to validate the lack of clarity. <laughs> And just to overview, our objectives over the course of this presentation is that we just want to help staff and patients learn about particular discussion points um, in having uh, a, tr a lung transplant discussion and to be aware of pertinent areas to explore prior to relocating. Um, and so some of the things that, that uh, we do encourage people to think about uh, before moving forward with the transplant are, are working. Um, can patients work? Can support people work? Um, and different ways to fund these. Um, so in terms of, of working, um, when you're looking at doing transplant, um, it can be very, very difficult uh, to work when you are on the transplant list. Um, a lot of it is centered around our physiotherapy requirements, which are three times a week, um, which can be difficult, uh, very difficult to put energy toward that and then put energy toward hours at work. So often our patients are no longer working. Um, when they are on the transplant list, that said, um, that is very individual. Um, so some of the things that we look at are how capable you feel, um, and your ability to do that um, while you're on the transplant list. Um, can you coordinate uh, the time to manage your treatment schedule as well? Um, so your different therapies, um, which, as you know, can sometimes take hours from the day. Um, and also, are you well enough um, in between your clinic visits? Are you being admitted to hospital frequently? Um, is it a bit of upheaval for your employer as well to fill in um, when you're taking time off work. And all of these uh, factors can play in. Um, and also uh, speaking or thinking about decreased energy, your shortness of breath, um, maintaining weight, um, weight loss, and uh, your mood will also play into these things. Um, so if you're considering stopping work or if, uh, if patients are considering stopping work, um, a lot of the worry is, will I be financially okay moving forward to transplant? Can I afford my medications if I stop work? Um, and that's something that social work will help out um, with some of those discussions and uh, help with some of the planning. Um, in terms of support people working, um, pre-transplant, we do have a lot of caregivers that will work, um, but again, it is very individual. Um, it's something that uh, sometimes support people will feel that that gives them some normalcy and keeps them grounded. Um, however, doing that double role as support person and uh, working at the same time can also lead to caregiver burnout. Um, so if caregivers are working full time, often there will be a subset of people helping out with the physiotherapy, the clinic appointments, um, and just generally making sure that uh, someone's well taken care of if they need it. Um, and some caregivers will work part-time and sort of balance the appointments with their schedule, um, and others will stop working completely. Um, and it really depends on their situation whether or not they would be eligible for income replacement. Um, some will be, some will not be. And again, that's very individual, so that's a place that social work can help, uh, can help to clarify. Um, in terms of fundraising, people will fundraise for transplant, um, and they do that in a variety of ways. Um, some will do a dance, silent auction, GoFundMe. Uh, some may rent out a restaurant or a bar um, to help towards some of those things, or even contact Lions Clubs um, and things like that, uh, Kiwanis, uh, to help out with some of the fundraising events as well. Um, 
we do provide documentation uh, to support that you may be moving forward with the transplant um, in order to sort of authenticate uh, your fundraising activity. Um, and we do caution people when they are fundraising as well, because your privacy of your health care is very important, and we want you to consider that um, when, uh, when you're looking at doing some fundraising for this, uh, because you're putting yourself out there, you're putting your health information out there, um, and so it's, if, you're, if you're wondering about what to limit or what's, what might be appropriate to include, um, social work can help provide some guidance with that. Um, and also, if you're looking at doing some fundraising, um, contacting the Trillium Gift of Life Network is a great way to incorporate some uh, organ donation awareness. Um, and you can also get some things like uh, some different uh, green ribbons and things like that to just sort of hand out to your guests um, and sort of include some of those things and raise some awareness too. Um, in terms of housing for transplant, um, social work can't tell you what the best thing to do is, um, but we can help you help people look at the different options. Um, it's, it varies from province to province what funding is going to be available for housing costs when you relocate for transplant, um, and also the requirements. Some provinces will require you to maintain a secondary your primary residence and then rent a secondary residence before they would give you funding. Um, it, because it varies from province to province, it's often helpful to contact your province or to contact your social worker um, to, to clarify some of those things. Um, the housing costs in Toronto um, are quite high. Uh, on average, for furnished units, we're looking anywhere between uh, $2,500 to $3,000 per month. Um, some are a little bit less than that, um, but they're harder to come by. Um, so information around those things are things that social work can definitely help provide. So when we continue to think about transplant, part of that is also thinking about coverage. So if you're in Ontario, your provincial coverage will absorb the cost of the pre-transplant care your lung transplant surgery, and the post-transplant care. If you're relocating to Toronto, you'll continue to be followed for your CF in the Adult CF Center at St. Michael's Hospital. You'll be connected to Toronto General Hospital and their social worker there who can help to assist you in applying for provincial resources to assist in relocation costs and daily expenses. These resources are meant to supplement your existing financial situation and will not unfortunately provide full coverage. Avenues will be explored to ensure that you have access to medication coverage with your CF and your Toronto General team, i.e. through Trillium Drug Program or through private plans. Patients from out of province would look at similar coverage. However, your home or Toronto CF or sorry, your home or Toronto CF transplant social worker can help you navigate the details of your coverage through your province. Your home province may be able to help with some of the costs associated with transplant, as mentioned before, while you're in Toronto. If you're coming to uh, Ontario from out of province, you'll not be asked to give up your provincial health plan as you're in Toronto for lung transplant, which is not seen as an intent to move to Ontario indefinitely. As a result, your home province will provide coverage through your provincial plan for the cost of lung transplant while in Toronto. The full coverage between provinces is not as simple to access as if you were currently living in the province of coverage, so it's essential that you connect with your CF and transplant teams to navigate these steps. Ontario residents will be asked to apply to the Ontario Drug Benefits through the most appropriate plan, which is often Trillium, if an individual is not receiving the Ontario Disability Support Program, or ODSP. This avenue, plus any additional coverage may, um, somebody may have through private insurances is often all that you need for coverage. Your OHIP will allow you access to coverage for medications and services while in Ontario. Most provinces will cover the standard list of medications recommended by Toronto General Hospital. Often the home province will provide a letter outlining a pre-approval for post-transplant medications. We are working with provinces during the pre-transplant period for out-of-province patients to ensure timely access to resources that might be needed, such as nutritional supplements, home IV services, and nursing. As every provincial coverage plan across Canada is particular to each province, our role as social workers is to work with you, your provincial government, and your CF team to navigate these channels in accessing coverage for pre- and post-transplant care. We also learned through experience that often coverage for the actual lung transplant and post-transplant care is well thought out. 
the pre-transplant period a little less so. As such, we work very closely with your provincial health plan, private home care companies, and CF teams to coordinate delivery of care in a timely fashion. We advocate for quality of life, which often means time out of the hospital. We have received pre-approval of pre-transplant care plans for some provinces for some patients and know that this is a big step in providing a seamless delivery of care. We understand that blanket approval for medication coverage can be difficult to obtain. However, any steps towards making this possible allows for more success in Toronto while we are negotiating discharge of a pre-transplant patient from an acute care setting. We've also learned through trial and error that provinces separate aspects of coverage, i.e. medication, supplies, and nursing services that have led to delays in accessing appropriate services. As such, any assistance for contact names, processes, uh, processes and steps to follow are helpful to the pre and post transplant teams while the patient is in Ontario. So for home oxygen, home O2 is covered by the home province. If the patient is already set up uh, on oxygen services, then our respiratory therapist will connect with the home O2 provider and ensure that it is set up in Toronto. If a patient comes to the community prior to a St. Michael's Hospital visit, the home oxygen company with guidance from the patient and local CF teams can have the services transferred. If home oxygen is newly set up in Toronto, the team respiratory therapist will connect with provincial services to ensure that qualification criteria is met for the province and then will set up a home oxygen service with a company that is billable to the home province. Some of, some, there will be some out-of-pocket expenses as there would be for anyone in Ontario uh, as well. And under medical transportation, uh, it's important to know that some provinces and some social support programs will provide assistance with the cost of travel and parking for your appointments, plus your relocation to Toronto. This is particular to province and program, so if you're not sure, contact your social worker to clarify, and this could be someone locally or us here in Toronto. Hope Air is also very helpful if your province does not provide the travel funding. And like Laura has mentioned, for housing, some provinces do provide a stipend through the health care plan for housing, but what's probably most important is speaking to your care providers to find out what you might be eligible for. And again, um, it is important to clarify what you might be eligible for prior to making your arrangements for relocation because it does vary from province to province and program to program. Um, so when we're looking at moving to Toronto, um, the housing costs, as mentioned before, are quite high. And so some things to consider when you're looking at housing are the price, accessibility of the unit, are there stairs to manage, um, is there a bathtub that you have to step into, um, proximity to the hospital, are you going to be bringing a car, is there cost of parking, um, do you want furnished, not furnished, um, how much space do you want versus how much you can afford, um, are you going to have people that you maybe don't know very well living with you and do you need some extra space or is it okay to maybe share a one bedroom unit to save on some costs. Um, so those are things that during the assessment and after the assessment when you're going to be put on the transplant list and um, the social worker would help you, uh, help you figure out. Um, in terms of financial planning, um, we definitely strongly recommend speaking to a financial planner about uh, these issues and that's if you have time. Um, we know that things often can happen quite urgently and if you are put on the transplant list quickly, you may not have time to do that. Um, so if you are viewing this seminar, it is very important to start thinking about how you might be able to budget for this um, so that down the road, if you do have to be listed urgently, um, you'll have one less stressor to think about because you already have a budget in mind. Um, back to fundraising, um, it is not mandatory, but it is something that's very, very helpful and we definitely recommend. Um, even if you're not going to be listed for transplant right away, um, it's okay to start the fundraising for that. Um, if you do that prior to going on the list, um, do rec we do uh, recommend that you add a caveat uh, to your fundraising, just saying what you would do with the funding if you did not actually proceed with transplant. Um, so some like to say that they would donate the funds to an organization, um, some explains that some of the costs will go toward therapies and medications that are going to be needed down the road, renovations to make your, your home more accessible to you um, or to help with your quality of life. Some say that if not moving forward with transplant, they'll go on what they call uh, you only live once trips or YOLO trips. Um, and just other things that uh, may need, you may need help with. Um, so moving on to income for support, um, there are strict rules around employment insurance for caregivers. Um, if you are eligible for employment insurance, 
Um, and to know if you're eligible, you can actually contact Service Canada to ask. There's a certain number of hours, et cetera, that uh, you, need to, you need to have done at work. Um, but you may be eligible to receive the adult caregiver benefit, which is up to 15 weeks, um, the sick benefit, which is also up to 15 weeks, or a compassionate care benefit up to six months. Um, so again, there are parameters around this that must be met, so it is important to contact Service Canada to see if you're eligible for this. Um, and I will say as well that these programs are often subject to change. The adult caregiver benefit is actually new as of December 2017. Um, so these things do change. Um, if you have questions, um, please contact your social worker to clarify. So now we're at the, the step where you may be moving to Toronto and now you've made this decision. And so now it's all about the practical aspect of moving. So we recognize that Toronto is a long way from home and you've likely had to have some very serious discussions and planning with people regarding this decision. Whether you've decided to rent out your home, you want to sell your place or sublet it. But keep in mind, like Laura's mentioned before, that in order to be eligible for your provincial assistance, that you will be required to maintain your primary residence in some circumstances. So it's very important for you to know that before you make your decision. You likely have had to leave family and friends and family, uh, sorry, family and friends, which can be a very emotional step. In addition, where you may have lived in a small town in northern Ontario or elsewhere in Canada, moving to Toronto can feel quite daunting. It's loud, it's busy, it's foreign. Technology is a wonderful tool to keep in touch, so it's really important to teach the people around you who may not know how to use it before you leave and have them get set up. I think when patients are here, it's often a really great way for people to connect uh, through social media or through, um, through being online, but it's also really important to be careful about treating your own information and health information um, respect, respectfully and be aware of your own privacy. When you're getting settled in Toronto, it is overwhelming to have you to deal with a moving to a smaller living place. So in Toronto, unfortunately, our rent is very high and our apartments downtown don't tend to be very large, uh, and especially when you're looking potentially living very close to St. Michael's Hospital. So the process of adjustment, we, we absolutely understand, can take some time and connecting with your local CF team, the transplant team, and virtually with other patients who can share your, their experience can help you feel more grounded. We very much recommend that. You'll be getting accustomed to your physiotherapy schedule, have several additional appointments in that first month that you relocated, and it can take a month or two to feel settled and in getting into your new routine. You're going to be getting to know a whole new team, and we, we appreciate that it's a difficult process when you have known your own team for much of your life. Your new team is different and will do things differently than you're used to. Your role is to try to make this process smooth by allowing yourself to be open to the changes in style and the process of information sharing. We'll do what we can to help you feel settled and more at home with your new team, but we'll also benefit from a very open dialogue with you. We recognize that waiting for a transplant can be very anxiety provoking. And the uncertainty of transplant coupled to the living in a new place while also worrying about life and family back home can be overwhelming. Connecting with supportive people locally or via family friends at home can be critical in managing your mental health. Unfortunately, while waiting for lung transplant, it's likely that a patient will need medical treatment. All approved patient coverage for medications will typically have been arranged through Toronto General Hospital Pharmacy. And any prescriptions given to you by your CF doctor can be dispensed through Toronto General at little to no cost. Speak to your pharmacist or social worker if you run into any difficulties. If you do require an admission to St. Michael's Hospital during the pre-transplant period, our team will meet with you and outline what the admission will include. The CF team will provide a standard of care affiliated with CF centres across the country. We'll connect with our colleagues at your CF centre to better understand your care needs. And if you're more comfortable remaining in hospital for the duration of your treatment, then we will support your decision. If home care treatment is preferred, then we will access normal avenues such as CCAC if you're from Ontario. But if you're from out of province, we will explore coverage with assistance from our team plus our provincial contacts with steps with what we need to do to, to coordinate that care. When we talk about the wait. Well, people will typically wait on the lung transplant list anywhere from six months to two years. You'll hear stories of people who receive lungs faster than that, but you'll also hear stories of people who receive their lungs after the long period of two years. It's important to re remember that everyone is different and the average wait time will not always apply to you. 
Okay, so we're going to take a look at after transplant now and some of the considerations for that. Um, during the recovery period, we do ask patients to stay in Toronto for at least three months after the surgery to participate in physiotherapy, um, clinic visits with your medical team, as well as to just regain your strength after the surgery. Um, we do see you weekly for those clinic appointments. Um, and you will be meeting your post-transplant nurse coordinator who will be highly involved in your medical care as well. Um, and that medical team is also then working alongside your CF team to transition you back home when it's time to do that. Um, some of the associated costs with staying in Toronto post-transplant um, are that you may be required to stay longer if you experience complications. Um, so because of that, it's important that your relocation plan is financially and physically sustainable for you and your supports for the long term. Uh, there may be some medications that are not covered by your provincial or private plan, and we do recommend uh, keeping access to roughly $1,000 or $2,000 if possible through savings, credit card, a line of credit, or fundraising, and just in case you require a medication that's not covered. Um, it helps to not delay the treatment if you have that uh, nest egg available. Um, so returning to Toronto for follow-up, once you've been discharged home or once you've uh, been given the green light to go home three months post-transplant, um, you will be asked to come for follow-up, usually once every three months with our team for the first year. It may happen sooner than that um, if there is something that comes up in your blood work or some of your testing back home that uh, our medical team really wants to address with you. Um, after that first year, the follow-up usually goes to once every six months and then once a year. Um, financial compensation for the travel and accommodations are often, but not always, covered by your province's medical travel program. Um, so if you're curious about the follow-up and the coverage afterward, um, clarify with your province's program directly or you can contact your social worker to discuss. Um, as previously mentioned, Hope Air can help with the cost of these flights as well. So that concludes our presentation. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you, Annie and Laura. We are now open for questions. So yet you can use the raise the hand feature and I can unmute you if you'd like to speak over the phone or you can type your question in the chat box on the right hand side of the screen. So not seeing any questions come in, we can conclude the webinar here. Oh, actually, sorry, one did come in from Pat. Um, what is Trillium Gift of Life for those of us in other provinces? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, the Trillium Gift of Life Network is the body that oversees organ donation in Ontario. Great. Okay, the webinar has been recorded and will be posted up on the healthcare section of Cystic Fibrosis Canada's website under the Transition to Transplant tab, and the recording should be available next week. You can also see all of our upcoming webinars on our website, and registration will be emailed as future webinars are scheduled. Thank you again to Annie and Laura and to everyone that attended today's session. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.